Yes. You went back again and again, did you not? Yes. Did he ever try to repeat the offence? Yes. <laughs> and after the second offence you went back? Yes. Etc. 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 <laughs> These absurd proceedings lasted several days. In his summing up, Chief Justice Monaghan concluded that if the alleged rape had been the subject of a criminal prosecution, it would have been thrown out of court because of the girl's failure to report it at the time and because of her continuing to receive letters and, it would appear, money from Sir William Wilde. As to my injudicious letter, the verdict of the jury was that it was indeed libelous, but the provocation had been unusually vicious and contrived. Damages were therefore set at the sum of one farthing. I was exonerated. We were all exonerated. But the fact that the costs were awarded against us and that these were considerably in excess of the £2,000 originally proposed for settlement mattered not a whit. I expressed my true feelings to my Swedish acquaintance, Rosalie Roos Olive Kroner, wife of Professor Olive Kroner of Uppsala, who had stayed with us for the Dublin meeting of the British Association. I have a copy of the letter here before me. The simple solution to this affair is this. Miss Travers is mad. She haunted our house to borrow money and we were very kind to her. Suddenly, she took a dislike to me, amounting to hatred. All Dublin has called to offer their support. We were only concerned about our dear foreign friends who could only learn of these events through the English papers, which are generally very sneering of Irish matters. <laughs> <laughs> Some years later, when the boys had reached Trinity, they regaled the family with a ballad commonly sung in the buttery. An eminent oculist lives in the square. His skill is unrivaled, his talent is rare. And if you will listen, I'll certainly try to tell how he opened Miss Travers's eye. <laughs> we soared about the miasma of the commonplace. <laughs> William's health was declining. His work declined as a result. He had suffered, as indeed had we all, several personal tragedies. His two <coughs> natural daughters, he did not disclose their mother's names to me, nor did I wish to be informed. Had died tragically in a house fire at County Monaghan. William's groans at their rural graveside were said to have deeply affected the small group of mourners gathered on that bleak hilltop. The death of our only daughter, Isola, greatly affected all of us. Oscar was inconsolable and felt moved to write a poem in her memory. Tread lightly, she is near under the snow. Speak gently, she can hear the lilies grow. All her bright golden hair tarnished with rust. He that was young and fair, fallen to dust. Lily-like, white as snow, she hardly knew she was a woman so sweetly she grew. Coffin board, heavy stone, lie on her breast. I vex my heart alone, she is at rest. Peace. Peace she cannot hear, lyre or sonnet. All my life's buried here, heap earth upon it. Requiescat. William. When? When Sir William died, it was found there was no money, for he had given much away for the relief of poor women and other deserving causes. Our house in Merrion Square was placed on offer to pay the debts. It was bought by Dr. Henry Wilson, William's assistant, who was, as we all knew, his son. 
Our son, Willie, got moitura, from the income of which he was to provide £200 a year for me. Oscar's portion was the house in Bray, which he sold to subsidise his London life. I applied to the Under-Secretary at the Castle for a civil list pension, but Mr. Disraeli would not countenance it. He required recipients to be loyal, orthodox, and moral. I was certainly ineligible on the first two counts, and he would probably have deemed me so on the third. Our friend, Dr. O'Leary, stated that Willie could be returned to Parliament as MP for a dozen places he had but to choose by the mere mention of the name Speranza. But Willie said the life of a politician did not appeal to him. I constantly urged the boys to marry. Willie often seemed on the verge of it. It is beyond me why so many young women of charm and fortune, including the beautiful Lady Westmeath, refused him, or else broke off their engagements after a time. Faced with irredeemable poverty, we forsook the squares of Dublin for the squares of London. Much later, Willie married Mrs. Frank Leslie, a wealthy New York widow, who, in a settlement so considerately arranged by him, provided £100 per annum for me. But Mrs. Leslie, or Mrs. Wilde, as I must call her, suddenly and unexpected sold the house from over his head and departed singly for Mexico. It is said, she remarked of Willie, that he was no good to her by day or by night. <laughs> Whatever she meant by that. The truth is, he was too good for her. In the meantime, Oscar had married Miss Constance Lloyd of Merrion Square. They settled in Chelsea. She brought him a reasonable fortune. Nevertheless, he continued to work as editor of the Women's World, uh, to which I contributed occasional pieces. When he reviewed an anthology of women's poetry, in which I was copiously represented, yet failed to mention my name, I wrote sharply to Oscar, Dear Editor, why do you not name me? Me, who holds such an historic place in Irish literature. You mentioned Miss Tynan and Miss Mulholland. Apropos, did you read Willie's article on soda water? It is so brilliant. Come for a talk on Sunday evening. I have so little time left now. For I must surely drown myself in a week or two. <laughs> Life is quite too much trouble. La Madre Dolorosa. <laughs> Oscar had published two volumes of fairy tales, which, though they hardly resembled mine, taken from the very mouths of the tellers, at least showed a distinctive family connection. Then came the plays, Lady Windermere's fan, an ideal husband. My greatest sadness was through frailty. I no longer went out at night, therefore I could not share in Oscar's success. But the beau monde carried word of it to me. When the importance of being earnest opened, one of my guests mentioned, quite in passing, that Oscar was now the foremost literary man of the day. A London cabman asked me if I was anything to Oscar Wilde. <laughs> Even the milkman asked for his picture. He was fated everywhere by leaders of society, fellow artists, and persons of rank. One of the latter, a pale young wisp of a man, towards whom I felt a curious antipathy, which of course I never disclosed to Oscar, <laughs> led him into a catastrophic legal suit, instigated by this boy's equally repellent and noble father. The grounds for this case were never quite clear. 
having suffered the outrageous reporting of the two cases in which I had been involved in Dublin, I never read a daily newspaper, much less an English one. Yet the truth, again, is not difficult to find. Envy of genius, of converse, of appearance, and in this instance, of pedigree. Ancient, artistic, and Hibernian. <laughs> daily verbal reports were brought to me of Oscar's supreme mastery of repartee in the witness box, but the might of the ruling English classes was against him. He was too successful, and under that onslaught he could only gain a moral victory, which, as his friends Mr. Ross and Miss Levison emphasised to me, he did. It cost him dearly, however. I had always warned him against late suppers and champagne. Still, one may reflect that while Oscar's writings are honoured throughout the intellectual world, who remembers Lord Queensbury but pugilists? <laughs> sought apartments for me nearer him, none ever became vacant. I did, after 17 years, obtain a small pension, because Mr. Gladstone was of a more enlightened turn of mind than his predecessor. At Oakley Street I received many Americans, for the New World recognises inspiration as one of the sources of liberty. One of these, the Comtesse de Bremont, a Bostonian married to a French aristocrat, became my firm friend. Her particular inclination was towards literature and life. She desired to be introduced to Oscar, who duly called to my chamber. And though she requested further acquaintance, Oscar was unfortunately too occupied with his many literary and social engagements. He may have been displeased when she referred to his new play, then in rehearsal, as Lady Windermere's Farm. <laughs> <laughs> the Comtesse de Bremont divulged many of her philosophic theories to me as we drank tea together. Not Mr. Finlater's, unfortunately. It was her view that where the soul and the brain are united in a natural combination, we behold the condition of the ordinary man and woman. Where the union of soul and brain is abnormal, the result is genius. This phenomenon is due to the hybrid state wherein the soul and brain are bound <laughs> in sexual antithesis. The feminine soul in the masculine brain edifice creates the condition of genius in men. Whereas the masculine soul in the feminine brain edifice creates genius in women. We establish through our tete tate symposia that I am the possessor of the masculine soul. The edifice in which it is housed is as feminine as you may please. From this singular opposition of soul and edifice derives my poetry, my appreciation of languages, of architecture, of music, and my understanding of the arts of decoration and dress. The contest, to her avowed regret, had never visited Ireland, much less my salon in Merrion Square. Yet I was able to describe to her the tasteful furnishings of the house, the cambric flounces with which I dressed the legs of the grand piano, <laughs> the gold ulster wall hangings spangled with green shamrocks applique, 
motifs of sunburst, wolfhound, and round tower embroidered in our parlour curtains. My London apartments were modest, yet I had contrived several schemes to remind me of home, especially several glass domes containing examples of the taxidermist's art, a stuffed Donegal eagle, several petrified red admirals, a hedgehog, and a toad, the unique Kalani toad that had escaped St. Patrick's censure. All these objects tastefully displayed interested my visitors enormously. The mothers of great men, the contest confided at another of our seances, the mothers of great men invariably possess the masculine soul. I thought of myself and Oscar. Poor Willie, though a grand esprit in his own way, would never be accounted one of the truly great men of history. But Oscar, for all his love of display, or perhaps even because of it, undoubtedly would. Napoleon's mother, the Comtesse reminded me, had been born in a camp. Oscar, she surmised, Oscar possesses the feminine soul. That is the ghost that haunts his edifice of life, that sits beside him at the fey feast and sustains him in the day of famine. These secret impulses weigh down <coughs> his manhood. The knowledge that he possesses the feminine soul, that he is a slave to the capricious feminine temperament, also to the feminine impulse of a wanton soul. All these give him the lust for strange, forbidden pleasures, and will impart to his final repentance the sublime abnegation of the Magdalene. <laughs> the sublime abnegation I confess I am not quite clear as to her meaning. <laughs> the Countess is a philosopher, I am an artist. And there are certain avenues of existence into which the one is unable to follow the other. The lust for strange, forbidden pleasures. What can she have intended by that? Oscar never drank to excess except when celebrating with young companions, before he took on the mature responsibilities of literature and parenthood. Nor did he ever take opium, though he told me some of his acquaintance had done so. The other day, Mr. Gavin Duffy called to Oakley Street. He seemed greatly aged. If I had aged, no one was any the wiser, for I kept the blinds perpetually lowered and subsisted by the light of a candle or two. We took tea in this crepuscular space. He was now Sir Charles Gavin Duffy. He'd been made Prime Minister of somewhere, New Zealand or New South Wales or somewhere down there. He told me he had lost the feel of things. Possibly he had. We all lose the feel of things. Oscar in an English jail. His wife in Genoa. She soon died there. Willie died. I assume I died. It is difficult to know. One leaves nothing but the image one has created in the mind of posterity. One does not know the moment when one passes into the state of that image. When at night we look into the fathomless star depths of the infinite, we long to know if the spirit